Good morning, everybody, excellencies, distinguished delegates, dear participants and guests. Welcome back. And thank you for joining us again for this research conference on sustainability in global value chains at the second day of the Forum on Globalization and Industrialization 2021. My name is Jan Lai. I'm head of the research program Globalization and Development at the GIGA, that's the German Institute for Global and Area Studies, based in Hamburg. I would like to welcome you on behalf of the research network Sustainable Global Supply Chains, whose partner organizations, the DIE, the Kiel Institute, the SWP, and GIGA, together with UNIDO, host and organize this conference. Funding for the network comes from the Federal Ministry for Economic Cooperation and Development and is of course highly appreciated. In fact, quite some of these funds remain unused as we sit in our home offices and lack the opportunity to discuss and engage further over coffee or lunch at the nice premises of UNIDO in Vienna. That was the original plan. Unfortunate, but necessary. However, I'm confident uh, that we will continue to have very interesting and uh, productive discussions in this virtual conference over one of the key issues of our time, the sustainability of production in global value chains. And without further ado, I would now like to hand over to Hiroshi Kuniyoshi, the deputy to the Director General of UNIL for his welcoming remarks. The floor is yours, Hiroshi. Excellencies. Distinguished delegates, ladies and gentlemen, I wish you all a warm welcome back and thank you for joining us again for the second day of the Forum on Globalization and Digitalization 2021, entitled a Research Conference on Sustainability in Global Value Chains. I hope you were able to attend the discussions yesterday. Such high level debates by policy and industry experts cannot be meaningful without evidence-based research. By combining a policy and research perspective into a unifying framework, UNIDO and its partners aim to establish a virtuous cycle, a cycle where our joint research and policy effects are in sync and help us better understand and respond to the problem our member states and stakeholders face. I am hopeful that through the Forum on Globalization and Industrialization, and the research conference in particular, we can stimulate the further development of a community of researchers, private sector, and decision makers working on anchoring the concept of sustainability more firmly in global value chains discourses in a way that leaves no one behind. and industrialization have highlighted some areas where public policy and private sector stakeholders are already working together. However, we need your drive and knowledge to pave the way towards new avenues of cooperation, as well as new perspectives on the big challenges we must overcome to achieve a more inclusive and sustainable industrialization, global trade and investment. And reach SDGs, in particular SDG 9. I will end here to leave more time for the important work ahead of us today. I hope you will find today's knowledge session stimulating and thought-provoking. I look forward to complete results of today's sessions, as well as our future exchanges and cooperation. I wish us a fruitful day ahead. Thank you. Thank you very much, uh, Deputy Director. I would now like to give the word to Amrita Nalika, the president of the GIGA and honorary fellow of Darwin College at the University of Cambridge. Amrita has extensively studied the international political economy of our trading system and is thus excellently uh, positioned to set the stage for this research conference. Over to you, Amrita. Thank you very much, Jan. Um, Kudos to you, um, to our cooperation partners for organizing this timely conference on sustainability in global value chains. Now, there is a growing repertoire of scholarship 
on this important topic. And empirical work has tended to focus on socioeconomic impact of certification or voluntary standards, or more generally, on the question of development impacts of, of the participation in global value chains, GVCs. And this is all very useful, very interesting. But there are important gaps. For instance, there is only limited work on questions of environmental sustainability, and in particular, social sustainability associated with participation in GVCs, and even lesser research thus far on the impact of related regulations, such as due diligence laws. This could be because attention has only relatively recently shifted to these possible negative externalities, downsides of participation in GVCs, such as the Rana Plaza, Rana Plaza incident. It could be because relevant policy initiatives are still new. Due diligence laws have only started to emerge, and we therefore lack robust evaluations of such initiatives to inform us about possible cons consequences, be this desired positive outcomes or unintended negative consequences. This could also be because some important aspects of sustainability in GVCs are difficult to measure and therefore difficult to investigate with existing methods and data including but not limited to health hazards, work, unpaid overtime, vaccination, so on and so forth. Often a lot of this happening in the informal sector. And so this conference is really at the cutting edge and it's taking an important step in addressing some of these crucial gaps. in GVCs. Its agenda fits nicely with the GIGA's global approach, which combines in-depth area expertise with comparative interdiscipline, interdisciplinary and multi-level analysis and generates insights from the experiences of the global south that are relevant from both an academic and also policy perspective. So today we'll be covering extensive ground together. You see from the agenda that we have quantitative studies on the environmental impact of GVC participation. And we will hear about the environmental performance of firms and countries integrated in the global economy through GVCs we will have presentations on the reaction of global value chains to global shocks, to crises, including COVID and MERS. And we'll be looking at the recent French law, a due diligence law on trade and farm performance. One session today will focus on specific actors in GVCs, such as farms and households, to understand the consequences of participation in these global supply chains. We have some interesting, innovative micro work at this conference. And this is an area where we, where we will be seeing more work, exciting work also in the near future. The qualitative studies on the program provide nuance, specific aspects of sustainability and value chains. So one broad theme is the governance of GVCs and how such governance links to the economic and social upgrading of actors in GVCs. We will see presentations on GVC governance in specific sectors, including agriculture, electronics, and the textile sector. These studies also provide a spotlight on some upcoming trends that may impact the organization of GVCs 
as well as how they can be designed sustainability. So for example, we will hear about new technologies such as industry 4.0 and blockchain. Now, naturally, we won't come up with all the answers that we need today, but we will address some tough questions and hopefully also stimulate further research on sustainability in GVCs in the future. To kick off today's deliberations, we have Professor Paola Conconi delivering the keynote lecture. So without further ado, let me hand the floor over to Professor Holger Gurk, who will be moderating this exciting keynote plenary session. Over to you, Holger. Thanks, Jan. Thank you very much, Amrita, for these very thoughtful and thought-provoking um, remarks on our conference. And yes, it's a day to look forward to. I think we're going to see a lot of uh, very relevant research addressing a number of the points you highlighted uh, in, your, in your welcoming remarks. So thanks for that. And yes, it's my pleasure now to introduce and to moderate this session, uh, to introduce Paola Conconi and to moderate this session. Um, Paola is going to give the keynote speech on the topic of trade protection along supply chains. Um, and Paula is a professor of economics at the uh, Université Libre de, in Brussels. And she is also a research fellow at the CEPR, Center for Economic Policy Research, and there at the International Trade and Regional Economics Program. And she is the director of the CEPR Research Network on Global Value Chains, Trade and Development. Paula is an international expert on global value chains and international trade and trade policy more generally. She has published extensively uh, on these issues and she's done a lot of relevant and interesting research in the last years. And Paula, without much further ado, over to you for your keynote lecture. Thanks, and just in term, just uh, in terms of time keeping, we have one hour for this keynote lecture. Um, so if you have any questions, um, use the chat function or the Q and A function, and we'll have time at the end yeah. uh, to discuss. Yeah, I think first of all, thanks a lot for the invitation. I wish we could have all been in Vienna, but I am. Um... Very happy to be here and I'll try to follow other sessions today. It's uh, my lecture is not going to be necessarily on sustainability, it's more about trade policy and how it affects global supply chains, but uh, I think the topic of sustainability, the various questions that were just mentioned, I think are super important and in fact part of my team here in Brussels is working on related uh, topics. Anyway, let me first try to see if I can share my screen, I guess so. So let me see if you move, see also the, share, the slides moving because sometimes, uh, do you see my slides moving? Yes. Yeah, perfect. okay, cool. So thanks a lot. First of all, feel free to interrupt me. I think I, you, can, you can also just unmute yourself and ask clarifying or other questions along the way. I always find it more, uh, more interesting and more engaging for everyone. So the, the paper that I'm presenting today has been an ongoing project, something that I've been working on for now the last two, three years in global supply chains. Uh, so the, the broad motivation for, for our project is the rise of China in world trade. If you look at uh, the last few decades, China went from accounting for less than 1% of world exports around 1990 to now being the largest exporter in the world um, by a long margin and for several years already. So, so this rise of China and the increased import competition from China has, of course, stimulated a, a very heated debate, both in academia and policy circles, about the impact of increasing competition 
import competition from China on jobs. And in particular, a lot of influ several influential studies like this author Dorn and Anson AER paper or this other paper on ER by Pearson Short. These are all papers that have looked at the employment effects in the US of increasing import competition from China, and in particular found large job losses in manufacturing due to this increased competition. Much less attention has been devoted to the role of trade policy, and in particular protection against China and the effects it has had on, uh, on jobs uh, and other outcomes. And only recently, as, a, as you see here in the second bullet, there's been a few studies, again, some of which are very influential, like this paper on the Quarterly Journal of Economics by uh, Pablo Abergam and co-authors, which have looked at Trump's uh, special tariffs that um, he introduced, President Trump introduced in 2018, and the effects they've had on prices, on wealth from various outcomes. But these studies have been really focused on recent protection. Uh, and, uh, and indeed, the title of Fabel Gametal was uh, Return to Protection. However, when you actually start looking more, you know, take a longer perspective on US trade policy vis-a-vis -vis China, you see that uh, trans tariffs were by no means a return to protection, but were an increase, a further increase in protection, because China had already been the target of uh, high protection by the United States for a long time. In fact, if you look at between 1988, which was uh, the start of uh, Bush senior presidency, and 2016, which was the end of President Obama's second term. So during these seven presidencies, average US anti-dumping duties, which are the most frequently type of trade barrier used by the US and other countries, more than tripled. And here is a picture to show you that. So if you look at anti-dumping duties on average that the US applies on Chinese imports, you see that there's been this dramatic increase well before Trump. What you see here in red is uh, anti-dumping duties under Trump, which have further increased, and other barriers, you know, other measures have been introduced, like Section 301, et cetera, but, but there was a lot of action uh, already before. And this is not only in terms of the level of protection, which you see here, but if you look at, for example, the share of Chinese imports that are sub have been subject to anti-dumping protection, again, it has more than tripled during this period. So what, uh, and I'm actually, I'm sorry, because this is, um, I'm showing you, but it's now too late, the, the version of my slides without the bullets coming one by one. So you're going to get the full slide, which is not what I meant, but nevertheless, uh, it may be more efficient in terms of time. Nevertheless, so the broad motivation, so the broad concern of this protection is, of course, that it may hurt, uh, it may hurt producers, particularly producers down, downstream. So if you look at this quote from The Economist, this is a quote in which uh, the CEO of the Bicycle Corporation of America is complaining about tariffs on key inputs, by components, steel and aluminum, which have raised production costs for his industry. And he say, claims that as a result, the plans to expand of this industry, the bicycle industry, are on hold, and this is costing American jobs. So this is the type of, so whether this is the case and what is the extent to it, you know, what is the effect of uh, protection along supply chains, in particular on jobs, is the focus of our paper. Uh, and the reason why, of course, we care about global supply chains is that over the same period in which we see these increase, over the same few decades, last few decades, you have had that production, which used to be concentrated, you know, in, in a few areas, so you used to we used to trade in final goods, and and, uh, and input were mostly sourced locally. Well, in this period, in fact, you know, production has been fragmented across uh, firms and countries, and as a result, there's been a huge increase in trade in intermediate goods, and actually, intermediate goods tend to be the ones that are subject to uh, a lot of protection, particularly until that. Duty. So steel in particular, but chemicals and other intermediates are often uh, the most targeted. And so the question becomes even more relevant, you know, if you put this, um, if, if the US and other countries uh, use protection, uh, what is going to be the impact on uh, along supply chains and in particular on jobs. So we want to contribute on this big 
debate on the so-called China syndrome, which has been focused on the effects of US uh, you know, uh, rising import competition from China on jobs. And we want to say, okay, but what is, uh, what is the impact of protection against China on jobs? And this is very, very important, of course, because today, even, you know, today in Washington, but in Brussels too, the big debate is what to do, you know, what, you know, what trade policy should we apply vis-a-vis -vis China? There are lots of old questions. We are not going to address them all, but this, you know, at the end, I'm going to go back to the policy implications which are gonna be very relevant, as I said, for ongoing debates in, on both sides of the Atlantic and elsewhere about how to best, you know, deal with China. Uh, and, and as I said, you know, we could spend a whole day discussing re reform or the WTO, lots of important issues, but, you know, I think this paper is gonna have something to say about that. Anyway, so what we do in practice is the first contribution is that we collect, uh, extensive data from the 1980s till today on um, protection is measured applied by the US uh, against China and other countries. So we, the data set is more extensive and we combine them with US input output tables in a way that I will explain to you to in, a, in order to be able to identify global supply chain and, and supply chain linkages. You know, if you want to say, okay, if, if a tariff is put on bike parts, of course, you know, bicycles are going to be vertically related, they're going to be using bike parts, but if you put tariffs on steel, which are the industries that are going to be affected, you need input output data to be able to trace uh, these vertical linkages and find out which are the, you know, industries that could be directly or indirectly exposed to trade policy. So once we um, uh, so once you have the data, you know, you could say, okay, we, you can just simply look, uh, run simple OLS regressions in which you study the, you know, you put trade policy on the right hand side and you look at employment growth on the left. The problem of, uh, you know, doing something uh, along those lines would be the trade policies, of course, endogenous. And this is something that has been pointed out by Trefler among many others. So you need to worry about the endogeneity of anti-dumping and other trade policies. So one of the, uh, so if you want the second contribution of our paper is to pro put forward a new instrument, a variable, a new instrument for anti-dumping protection, which as you'll see, combines, builds on the idea that certain industries become very important in some during some electoral terms due to swing state politics in the United States. And of course, I'm going to spend an extensive part of my talk explaining to you the logic of our instrument. And so through using this instrument, we can then look at causal effects. So because we can exploit exogenous variation in uh, trade protection, and then identify the causal effects of protection on jobs in both vertically related and uh, and directly exposed industry. And what we find, and this is just a summary of the main results, is that on net, the effects of job is negative, and actually there's a sizable negative effect on for the US economy as a whole of, of protection against China. What, what anti-dumping protection does is it decreases employment growth in downstream sectors along the lines of what the, the, the claim on from the economies was. So you if you look at industries that use the protected uh, inputs, employment growth in those industries is significantly uh, decreased. And we don't find any positive effects in directly exposed in the protected industry and in industry upstream of those. So there's just large negative effect now streams. We also, and I don't know if I left the time, uh, we also look at mechanisms behind these negative employment effects, looking at the effects of protection on prices and production costs, because the key mechanism, again, along the lines of this quote, is that what protection does is to increase production costs for downstream industries. And this is what, by incre the increasing production costs, you decrease employment growth. This is costing American jobs. So this is uh, what we also show, not only so that is protection. If you protect the, uh, uh, if you put higher tariffs on imports of key intermediates from China, this is going to decrease imports, not only from China, but overall. So 
we find a negative decrease on imports. This is pushing up prices, both prices of imported uh, goods and prices of domestic goods. And this is in turn leading to higher production costs. And this is hurting producers of, uh, that use the protected inputs, uh, the protected products as inputs. So feel free to interrupt me, otherwise I'm going to continue. I see some people who have, uh, I know, I guess you can simply unmute yourself. You have the possibility of doing so, so feel free to do so. As I mentioned, I, I don't mind on the contrary. So let me just say a brief word about the, the, the literatures we are contributing to. I already mentioned these two literatures on uh, the, the rise of China and the so-called China syndrome or China shock and the recent literature on protection, you know, recent protection against China. We are basically uh, building also on the on, on literatures and including some of my own previous work that has looked at how trade policy affects trade in intermediate and global supply chains, but we are the first to uh, to focus on anti-dumping, which is the most widely used protectionist measure, and to provide uh, an instrument. So to, to, to be able to identify causal effects through an instrumental variable approach. And, and by focusing on anti-dumping, we're also contributing to an extensive literature on anti-dumping. And I'm actually going to cite some of these studies earlier because some of our what builds uh, on, for example, this AER paper by Bloning and, and Park. Okay, so um, in terms of data, as I said, one of the, the, the first contribution is to construct a rich database. In fact, the database, you know, these efforts started a long time ago. One of my co-authors, Chad Baum, used to be at the World Bank, and he uh, was leading a team collect, constructing this temporary trade barrier database of the World Bank that com it comprises or as, you know, includes anti-dumping, countervailing duty, safeguard, all the key uh, protectionist measures uh, and covers 30 countries from 1980 till 2014 when Chad left the World Bank and the data set was discontinued. So what we have done is, you know, com completed the data. So we have updated the data set. So we have all the measures for the US and the other around 30 countries from the 1980s till today. In this study, we mostly focus on anti-dumping because this is by far the most widely used protectionist measure. In robustness checks, we include uh, other measures and, and the results are unaffected, but the key action is anti-dumping and we can actually discuss why. They are much more political, much more flexible. You know, also WTO rules are much more flexible when it comes to the use of anti-dumping. And as a result, that's where all the action is. Uh, something I want to also mention, so we are focusing on China, pro US protection against China, and the reason is that not only the big debate uh, on uh, trade and labor is on China, and China has become you know, the biggest exporter in the world, there's been this incre incredible rise in China as a world training power, but as a result, over 70% of US protectionist measures are against China or, you know, during a sample period. So it's clear that China has been the biggest target. And by the way, this is true for the US, but it would be true for Europe too. If you look at European anti-dumping duties, they're mostly targeted against China in this period. Okay, so this is in terms of the data on trade policy. Of course, what we need to also measure is how, as I said before, is how, if you put a tariff on, on an input, say steel, paper, organic chemicals, plastic materials, these are some of the key inputs in the economy. Which other sectors are going to be affected? So which other sector use all those inputs as um, uh, in their production? So what we do is to use data from the Bureau of Economic Analysis in the US, which is very disaggregated. So it provides information of input type of linkages between 479 industries. Some of you, uh, while working on global supply chains may, may be used to uh, wired, so the world input output table, this is much, much more aggregated. It has around 14, if I'm not mistaken, manufacturing industries. The beauty of the US input output tables is it's much more disaggregated. And this is key because trade policy is really 
very disaggregated. In fact, we will already have measurement error or measurement issues because we are aggregated from trade policy, which is really at the product level to industries, these 471 seek for industries, which are more aggregate than trade policy. And I'll, again, I'll go back to this later, but nevertheless, we are able to go quite finely. We are, we are able still to look at the seek for, which is much more disaggregated than a lot of studies. Uh, they use uh, broader input output tables. So here is just the, the definition of the variable. So this is how we construct uh, combining data on tariffs and data on input output linkages. How do we construct measures of exposure to trade protection? So the first one is a very simple one, is the direct tariff exposure. The, if you look at an industry J, take uh, you know, the example back of the economies earlier, the bicycle industry being J, in year T, the exposure to tariffs is simply uh, the average duty in that anti-dumping duty against China uh, applied by the US in, on imports of industry J. So that's simply average tariffs in that industry. When you want to look and spread along supply chains and you want to say, okay, what is the exposure by an industry to input protection? So that's what we call downstream tariff exposure. This is the exposure of the downstream industry. Now you're looking at the bicycle industry as a downstream industry. And what the way you construct this is to look at from input output tables, what are all the industries I that are inputs, uses inputs in the production of J. So for example, bicycle parts, steel, aluminum, all of these. And as this is basically a weighted average of the input tariffs with where these omega ij's are the coefficient that the input output coefficient, the cost shares from that tell you how important if you want is input how i in the production of j. And similarly, you can construct an upstream tariff exposure using total, uh, you know, the share of industry j's. Uh, sales in the production of ice. So this is very standard, so there's nothing very fancy, but we do also, this is our baseline measures, we do a lot of robustness, uh, for example, weighting by uh, import penetration ratios. I mean, I don't know how many of you are working on trade. I, I'm, I'm, uh, feel free if you want more details, I'm not, gonna, I'm not gonna go into too many details because I think the audience uh, may get bored, I may also run out of time, and we may want to spend maybe more time on, on the, given the audience on some of the policy discussions at the end. So the, as I said, once we have the data, and we have, by the way, much more data than, uh, than uh, what I said here. So we also construct, collect data on imports, collect data, of course, on employment. Uh, from various sources or prices that we are going to use in our analysis, but these are the main data set, the data set on tariffs and the data on input output linkages. Uh, okay, so once you have uh, uh, these measures, as I said, you could in principle say, oh, I'm just going to run simple OLS in which I study, I collect data on employment at the industry level and I look at how an industry's employment growth is affected by, you know, direct uh, and indirect tariff exposure. The problem with, uh, with, these, uh, with doing so is that, again, these uh, protectionist measures are not falling from heaven. They are, they are endogenous. And in particular, there are certain, uh, you know, certain variables that would shape, that shape trade protection. They could also be correlated with employment growth, both in the same protected industry and in vertically related industry. And as we argue in our paper, and as we actually show in empirical analysis, if you simply run OLS, S, S, OLS regression, ignoring the endogeneity of trade policy, you will actually have a hard time identifying negative effect of protection. The, the estimates will be small and often not significant. While, uh, and again, this is in line with the idea and that there are omitted variables that would be correlated with both protection and, and, and employment growth, that actually work against uh, you being able to identify this negative effect. Again, if you interrupt me, we can go and discuss examples of these omitted variables that will, cre will create a problem. But the general concern anyway, is that 
ignoring endogeneity will give you bias estimates. And what we argue here that the estimates will be biased in a way that will tend to underestimate the negative effect of protection on downstream industries in particular. So what do we then do? Well, we do what many people do in, in uh, these days, which is to use a shift share identification strategy. So to construct an instrument that combine, com, com, uh, if you want, shifters, so, is, so a set of exogenous shocks, which are usually called in jargon shifters, and uh, differential exposure to, of these uh, across industry to these shocks uh, as measured by shares. This is, for example, used a lot in the China shock uh, in, in literature. Uh, where, for example, the AER paper by Otto Don and also, but you know, many, many other papers, not only in trade, but in labor, in development. This is a very broad uh, strategy. In our case, the novelty is that our instrument is going to exploit political shocks in the United States. And what are these political shocks? These are going to be changes in the identity of swing states across electoral terms. And I'm going to spend time in the next few slides explaining to you uh, why we think this is exogenous, why do we think it matters, and showing you that, uh, that these uh, combining these exogenous shocks, which are, you know, capture changes in which states are politically important over time, with heterogeneous exposure to these shocks across different industries, allows us to predict variation in anti-dumping across industries and over time. And then we, and, and this is going to be exogenous variation, which we can then uh, exploit to study causal effects of Paris uh, along supply chains. Uh, for those of you who are into these, uh, you know, I probably will skip. But you know, a big debate. There are lots of debates about these shift share instruments, and and I think an important uh, concern comes from the, possi the possible endogeneity of the shares. And so, what we are doing is actually some of the most recent robustness check. This is, for example, uh, this uh, recentering of the instrument that Boris Akhetal uh, proposed, and that's one of the important robustness we also do on our paper. So our, our, in general, what I'll show you, our results are super robust to the latest uh, you know, robustness checks proposed on, in this literature. So let me explain to you, for those who are not familiar with US politics, uh, why uh, we would, uh, you know, how our, our instrument works and what's the logic. So uh, as you know, in the United States, the president is actually not directly elected by voters, but is elected by electors. So what you do, voters elect these electors in the state, and then it's those electors that elect the president. And in fact, what happens is then uh, you, you don't need, you just need 50% of the votes in a state to get all electors. So it's, uh, there's no proportionality. It, it's a strange electoral system whereby you just need, as I said, as a candidate, if you're Biden and you get 51% uh, of votes in California, you get all elected. So what this implies is this uh, electoral uh, rule for the presidential elections imply that presidential candidates have uh, incentive to focus uh, in their efforts to gain votes on states that are expected to be swing. And what does it mean swing is that they're expected to be closed, you know, where the difference in vote shares between the two candidates, the Republican and Democratic candidate is expected to be small. And uh, because, you know, if you know you're gonna win for sure that state, you don't worry about, uh, about losing or about trying to make effort to win it, you know California is going to go Democrat anyway, for example, these days. But you know, it, there may be states where they, they, they are closer call, and then that's where you would put your effort in terms of campaign visit, in terms of policies that may you may use to, to help important industry in those states. So we already know from some of the previous studies, including by the way, this recent uh, return to protection Fabrega Metal QJE paper that you know, if you look at trade policy, 
and different kinds of trade policy, um, like Trump's tariffs, or in, in this GIE paper I have with various co-authors, uh, we look at trade disputes filed by the US. There is uh, a skewness toward important industry. Industries are important in the state, swing states. So the idea that swing state politics matters for trade policy is not new. We are building on that. And we are building, you know, but we are the first to, to sort of saying, okay, let's use this idea to construct an instrument for anti-dumping. So first of all, how do we measure swing states? Well, in the baseline uh, definition, we use the standard definition used in all these studies, which is retrospective. And therefore, so when you're looking at a term T, a term is every four years uh, between a presidential election and another, a state S, is classified as swing if the difference in the vote shares between Democratic and Republican candidates in the previous, hence with the retrospective nature, presidential election is less than 5%. Then we do a lot of robustness checks with alternative definition, but this is the standard definition. And if you apply this definition to our sample period, what you see is that which states were swing and, and how many of them were swing changes a lot over time. For example, California, I said they were, you know, today it will not be swing. Today, you know, there's been a blue state steadily so for many years. But at the beginning of our sample, actually, the difference in both shares was very small. And, and you see that the, the number, both the number and identity of swing state change uh, over time. Then how do we go? So this is going to give, you know, this is, what we argue is exogenous variation. This is our shifter, our shock. This is a political shock that says, oh, in this term, now this is the state you want to win. Uh, now, uh, and, and what we show, we have an appendix where we show that this variation is not, into, is not driven by trade policy. The main concern could be, is this exogenous through trade policy? We show that anti-dumping and other trade policy have no effect on which states are below the 5% difference in vote margins so it, and become classified as swing. So this is going to be exogenous variation in the political importance of states, but how do you go from states to industries? Because after all, you need an instrument for a policy that is not applied, it's not a state level policy, but it's applied actually to products within industry. So we then use the shares so that you, know, you, you have a particular state that becomes a swing during a term, and during that term, swing industry captures, if you want, the political importance of that industry in a term. And that is uh, measured by the number of workers employed in industry J uh, at the beginning of our sample in 88 in states that are classified as swing. So you're basically saying, OK, in a particular term, I look at every industry J. And I look at uh, where, you know, how many jobs are in this industry in states that are politically important. And, and this is going to capture the time varying political importance of industries. And the variation is not going to come from employment shares that are fixed at the beginning, but it's going to come from changes in the identity of swing states. So when, for example, Pennsylvania becomes a swing, uh, well, since a lot of steel is concentrated in Pennsylvania, then in, in a term in which Pennsylvania or Michigan or uh, state in which steel is concentrated are swing, then uh, this variable will, uh, will increase for swing. Or when, uh, you know, Florida was swing at the beginning in 2000, I'm, I'm not mistaken, then say shrimps or crawfish or all these uh, industry that Florida uh, in which there's a lot of employment in Florida will become, you know, this will increase, this, in, this swing industry will increase uh, for terms in which Florida is swing. So you have basically a way through these swing state politics to get exogenous variation coming from changes in the identity of swing states in the political importance of industries. Now, the question is whether then this is going to be um, you know, I'm going to show you that exploiting this variation and combining this variation with uh, a second feature of the industry, uh, which is anti-dumping experience, is going to give us a good predictor of changes in anti-dumping duties over time. 
So uh, the other thing that we exploit, and here's where we build on this Bloning and Park ER paper I was mentioning before, is that if you look at the process of uh, anti-dumping petitions in the United States, it is extremely legally, institutionally complex. If an industry wants to get anti-dumping protection against China, it has to provide substantial uh, information, legal arguments, so it's extremely cumbersome. We have a footnote with all the details, and you can see that this is indeed, as argued by Bloning, and a very complex process, which means that if you have played the game before, you've already filed anti-dumping uh, petitions in the past, you have an advantage. What he shows, and what it's true in our data too, is that if you have prior experience, this decreases the cost of initiating a new case, a new petition for anti-dumping, and also increases your likelihood of success. So we explore this idea. So what we do, we, in, we collect information on our pre-sample petitions for anti-dumping for each industry, J, and this is going to capture the ability of an industry to file for anti-dumping, to request for anti-dumping petitions. So once we, so we have basically a measure here, the swing industry that is capturing changes in the political importance of an industry over time. And then we have uh, another measure, anti-dumping experience, which is instead not time varying and is just capturing the ability of an industry to uh, petition to request anti-dumping. So our instrument, now I can define it for you, is the interaction between these two measures. So, uh, what we, we, we want to predict uh, with our instrumental variable, uh, the level of anti-dumping protection, and we are going to use as an, as an ID the interaction between the swing industry measure and anti-dumping experience. So what is the logic behind uh, this interaction is that if you look at a presidential term, Anti-dumping protection should be skewed, should favor industries that are important in swing states because that's where politicians want to win, gain votes, but only if this industry, J, has experience that allows, it, allows to exploit this political advantage. Because you have some industries that never file anti-dumping before, and even if they have their rank high in swing industry, they have zero protection. So as I'll show you, exploiting both uh, swing industry and experience is actually key to predicting anti-dumping. What we can show you, uh, but I'm gonna skip this, is actually if you use an instrument, you can not only explain uh, or predict anti-dumping duties, but also actual micro level decision, for example, by the International Trade Commission, their votes on anti-dumping, how commissioner votes on anti-dumping is predicted by RRB, even when you control for commissioner fixed effects, uh, industry and near fixed effects. So it's, uh, this is sort of providing micro level evidence for the logic of our instrument. So let me, what we then do is say, okay, if, first of all, does the instrument work? Because in order for us to be able to, to use this instrumental variable to study the effects of protection along supply chains, we need that this is a good predictor of uh, anti-dumping. So to check that, we can look at whether, uh, if you look at any industry, tradable industry, because these can, can only be defined for tradable industry, any tradable industry J in a particular term T, controlling for, for an industry and term fixed effects, you know, does our instrumental variable predict uh, these variations? So this is, looking within an industry, say, steel, over time, and, and exploiting these changes in the political importance of uh, swing states to identify you know, this coefficient. So if our instrument works, beta 1 should be positive and significant. What we show you, what I show you here is that if you use IV, so the instrumental variable, it, you get a positive and highly significant coefficient. If you only use swing industry, so the, the one or two components, you don't predict. So the reason is that you really need, you know, what is key is, uh, is to combine the political importance of the industry with its, uh, again, anti-dumping experience, its ability to exploit these, these, these political importance to be able to predict anti-dumping. So, you, you know, what matters is really 
uh, the, the two, you know, the instrument is a good predictor, but only if we combine the two components, the two variables. And, and it makes sense. It should be like this if you believe in the literal anti dumping, you know, swing state politics should matter, but also uh, uh, given the complexity of the anti dumping process, previous experience should also matter. So when you would, here is just a, a table showing you that if we use this ID, you know, you can change the measure of protection. You can use, uh, you can measure anti-dumping in different ways. You can also go beyond anti-dumping and look at all temporary trade barriers. You can exclude steel, which is the most widely protected input. You can, or industry, you can look at forward definition of swing states or alternative definition of swing states in any case, our IV strategy does a good job of predicting changes in anti-dumping uh, duties uh, within industries over time. And so we can then use this instrument to, uh, to study, finally, the effects of protection on, uh, on jobs, on jobs in protected industries and in uh, vertically related downstream and upstream industries. So when uh, I'm, I'm sorry uh, for for all these, uh, for I don't think there's many equations after these. Again, I don't know. I think this is a, a mixed audience. Some are, are probably economists and some are not. But uh, hopefully you want you know you can bear with me. And again, feel free to interrupt if something is not clear. So this is the main regression that we to least stage risk square regression that we run where to study. Uh, the effects of protection along supply chains. This is very similar in spirit to uh, what Asemoglu and co-authors have done in their own study on, so what Asemoglu et al. do in the Journal of Labor paper is to study the effects of increasing import competition from China on US jobs, both in directly competing industries those that are directly competing with imports from China and those that are upstream and downstream. So we are running a very similar uh, regression in differences, but now instead of having uh, exposure to import competition, we are studying exposure to tariff protection, to import, uh, to protection against China. So first, just to, to, to study the direct effect, so to look at the effects on protected industries, we can just put our measured direct tariff exposure instrumented by our ID. And then we always control also for the non-interacted uh, swing industry. So we are running these things in differences. So we are looking at changes in employment. So in fact, this is gonna be growth rate of employment in industry J. So think about any industry. Uh, in fact, here, when you look at direct exposure, you can only include uh, industries that are tradable for which the variable direct tariff exposure can be defined. And we are looking at changes in, in protection and how that affects changes in employment. And then we will later include downstream tariff exposure and upstream tariff exposure, the changes in it, and the corresponding uh, swing industry variables to look at the indirect effects. So here is the baseline table. So what, when we look at the direct effect, we don't find any positive effect. And you see this first column is only putting direct tariff exposure. So if you protect steel or protect chemicals or protect, if you just look at the protected industries and you look at the effect of these direct tariff exposure on employment growth, in the protected industry, there's no significant effect. And uh, if you want, here is uh, some, you know, going back to the aggregation issues, this is not surprising. You know, it may seem surprising you think, oh, you should save some jobs in the protected industry. Well, you know, there may be some, a few job gains, but the net effect in protected industry is what we see in our table and in all our results is extremely robust, is not significant. And the reason is that in fact, at the C4 level, when you look at the industry, you actually have both direct and indirect effect because an industry like SIC 43312, this is, the title is Blast Furnaces and Steel Mills. This is what the steel industry. But within this industry, there are many products, 234, five 
HS products, some of which get protection and some of which don't. So for example, you know, if you look at the, in 2001, the US introduced anti-dumping duties on particular steel products, hot roll steel products. These cover 27 of the 235 HS products that are in this industry. And, and, uh, and, what, and some of them are, were not protected, including, for example, tramway rails. This is, a pro this is a product that was not protected, but uses octroll steel as an input. So what you have is that when you're actually looking at this tariff exposure, since this measure has to be constructed at the industry level, because that's where the employment data we have is, so we have to aggregate up, then you're going to mix direct and indirect effect. And so not surprisingly, the net effect is actually insignificant. When you're instead looking at the indirect effect, which we start doing in column two, three, and four, uh, first looking only at tradable sectors and then looking at all sectors, what you start seeing, and this is something that is uh, super robust, you know, we have tons of robust and check, you see these uh, very sizable and negative coefficient on downstream tariff exposure. So this is capturing the, uh, the negative effect on employment growth in downstream industries of uh, anti-dumping protection against China. So if, if you use uh, you know, these coefficients, our estimates imply that if you increase input tariffs by one standard deviation, then you will decrease the annual growth rate of employment in uh, downstream industries by 5.3 percentage point. And you can actually compute, and here I'm just going to go straight to the numbers, you can do a counterfactual exercise similar to what Asimov et al. did to compute job losses due to trade with China, you can do here a counterfactual exercise saying, okay, what are the job losses based on a uh, difference uh, estimate that are due to trade protection against China? And what uh, we have in, based on our estimates is that more than 2 million jobs were lost across all sectors in the economy, US economy, due to trade protection against China. You should interpret these job losses as either jobs that were actually destroyed. So there were, you know, people were fired. These are jobs that were destroyed in industries that were declining or in industries that were growing, take the construction industry or many industries in this period were growing. Well, our estimates in this case should be interpreted as jobs, additional jobs that would have been created that were not created because of protection of, uh, against China. So again, if you go back to the example of uh, the bicycle producer in the Economist article I cited, he was saying, if you put tariffs on steel, aluminum, biparts, this is increasing our production costs. And as a result, we are putting our plans to expand on hold. So this is an industry that is expanding, but it, sh it could expand more if it wasn't for, um, you know, if it wasn't for this uh, protection in, on its inputs. So this is how you should interpret our, our estimate. So it's either jobs destroyed or jobs that could have been created, additional jobs that could have been created uh, in the absence of protection. Something I want to point out is that a lot of the job losses are actually not in tradable uh, or manufacturing manufacturing sectors, but outside. And this is because if you look at uh, supply chain linkages, of course, in terms of which industries are involved in global supply chains, these are all tradable industries. But then take construction. Construction is a very large economy, a large sector for most economies, including the US, employs a lot of people, and it relies on uh, um, protected inputs like steel. This is a key input for construction or restaurants rely on uh, shrimps. When shrimps uh, or crawfish or all these uh, seafood, so if you increase tariffs on, uh, or hospitals, sorry, just to keep looking at service industry, large service industry, restaurants, hospitals, hospital relies on chemicals. Chemicals are often uh, protected by anti-dumping. So if you protect, uh, key manufacturing inputs or non-manufacturing even outside, but tradable industries, this is going to have an impact, not only on downstream industries 
that are tradable themselves, but also on large non-manufacturing industries that use these protected in, in products as inputs. And, and in fact, as we show, a lot of the losses uh, due to anti-dumping protection are in outside manufacturing, these large service industries. Here, uh, again, since uh, this is not a technical presentation, I'm gonna skip uh, this important robustness check, but for those of you who are economists who are working on chief share instrument, this, uh, this is actually a very important robustness that I think everyone should do. So we very much worry that our main results could be driven by non-random exposure to the shock. So the fact that our shares, employment shares, experience shares could be correlated with characteristics, you know, could be non, you know, could give us non-random exposure and omitted variable bias due to that. And I think the beautiful paper, which is almost uh, published on Econometrica by Boris Yark et al, provides a way to deal with this concern by basically randomizing the, uh, the shocks. And so that's what we do. We apply their methodology and what we find uh, is basically uh, results that are very similar. Again, big losses in downstream industries and no, uh, and no gains anywhere else. So we also worry about the exclusion restrictions. So the fact that uh, what we are picking up through our instrument may be not the effect of anti-dumping, but the effect of other policies that could uh, be used to favor important industries in swing states, and in particular subsidies. So we do a lot, including uh, controlling for subsidy exposure. So we collected, and this is a job of one of my doctoral students who. Uh, did a great job, Elisa Navarra, in collecting all the data on subsidies. And so we can even control for, you know, subsidies granted to industries uh, directly or upstream, downstream. And again, our result, our main result, which is this very negative downstream uh, tariff exposure coefficient is always robust to that. And we have tons of other robustness, including controlling for more tariffs, extending the analysis to Trump, which only makes these numbers of losses bigger, uh, and other more technical robustness, which I will skip. We also combine our instrument with the instrument of Walter Dorn and Anson to, to look jointly at the job losses due to import competition from China and trade protection against China. So here we are redoing what Asimov et al. do uh, in their paper. We even use the same fixed effects, the same time period, everything. And since the two instruments are not correlated, they, we can actually combine them. And what we see is that we get back their number, 2.3 million jobs were lost due to import competition from China. So these are job losses in directly exposed industries, industries that were competing with imports from China. There were, there were job losses there, but there are additional job losses, almost a million in based on our counterfactual that are um, due to protection against China. And this leads me to uh, maybe the policy implication. Let me skip the mechanism. And let's go back so that we can have more of a debate about uh, the implications. So what, what our analysis shows is that uh, if you carefully measure protection along supply chain and deal with the endogeneity of, of protection using an instrumental variable approach, what you see is large negative effects of protection on employment growth downstream and no job gains uh, in other sectors. So, you know, if you want in, in, in very recent years, you know, there's been a very, uh, you know, important backlash against globalization, trade, but, you know, more generally, I would say globalization. And in fact, politicians in, in, uh, in Western countries or advanced economies have, have actually pointed the fingers at China as being the culprit, the cause of, uh, in particular, decline in job losses in manufacturing, all, all sorts of bad things. And in, but in particular, there's been this focus on job losses and how China has been responsible for the job losses. And, and I think the, the temptation, and in fact, something that many, many uh, you know, governments have done is to increase protection against China. 
However, what our paper shows is that, you know, rather than fostering uh, employment growth, politically motivated protection uh, in the form of anti-dumping, which is by far the most widely used protectionist measure against China by the US and any other country, is actually giving rise to additional job losses. And this is actually very much in line with what, you know, you hear businesses in the US are currently, I mean, this was this summer, there was a quote from the FT, but this is a letter, actually, you know, it's a quote from a letter that, you know, all US businesses, large businesses, industry association, they all called on the Trump administration, on the Biden, sorry, administration to change the policy, trade policy against China, which so far hasn't happened, to mitigate significant and ongoing harm of protection against China on the US economy and US workers. And again, they say due to tariffs, US industry pays increased cost to manufacture products and provide services. So this is exactly what we show. So we show an increase in production costs and, and a decrease in employment growth in line with these quotes and the quote I gave you before, which again suggests that trade protection is not the, the policy to use if you want to save jobs. Uh, and uh, you know, let me maybe uh, skip these and so that we have more time to, to debate uh, or you know, for questions if you have any. And I have lots of, uh, you know, I can go much more in detail if you're interested for those of you who are more interested in the, um, yeah, in the details, I have a lot of slides that I can go deeper into, into those, of course. So, yeah. Okay, thank you very much, Paula, for this really insightful and also entertaining uh, presentation. And I think it really sets the scene for today quite well, looking at the impact of trade policy, which was also a topic uh, that was discussed yesterday. Uh, a couple of questions have come in, um, and let's start with those. And otherwise, if you have further questions, uh, either use the Q&A or chat function or also raise your virtual hand. We can then allow you to, uh, to participate. Um, one question that has come in concerns the exogeneity of your instrument. Um, and you did briefly mention this, but only in passing, really. And the, the question here is really, um, well, uh, how about the reverse causality? So trade policy does uh, change voting behavior. We know that from a number of studies for the US, uh, for other countries. Um, and uh, I mean, that could potentially make uh, states swing states. So. Um, yeah, yeah, yeah. How would you Obviously respond to we, that? We, we worry about it. Although, I mean, so we, let me, you still see my screen, eh? So let me go to these. Uh, okay, so I, 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 by the way, yeah, I have a lot more that I think could be interesting, but I'm just going here. So when you look at, so when you look at changes in anti-dumping, you can take anti-dumping duties and construct measures at the state level. So you can look at changes in anti-dumping protection granted to a state. You just use the shares of employment and you can go to a state level measure of anti-dumping protection, a state term. What you see is that anti-dumping protection does not, uh, so wait, eh? So the dependent variable is uh, identity of swing states. You can look at the identity or changes in the identity is not affected at all by changes in anti-dumping protection. And similarly, because there was, I presented this paper at Columbia and I was just showing the first column and robustness. This is also very robust, but you, you know, I think it was Eric, um, uh, oh, come on. The guy who works on quality, Eric, uh, China affects, you know, voting behavior and and, uh, and swing state uh, and whether a state is swing. So we also check that. And again, changes in import is competition from China, uh, how exposed a state is to import competition from China, does not affect whether the state is swing. Don't forget that we are not looking at whether votes in general are affected, but whether the difference in vote share is below or above the 5% threshold. So we are really, you know, it's more than saying, so although there may be that, you know, some voters may be affected, you know, here what you need is that the identity of swing state, which, which states are below the 5% threshold is not affected by trade policy or import competition. And indeed we don't find any evidence of it. 
uh, you know, but again, we are looking at, uh, yeah, so this is, uh, this is something that, you know, should be reassuring, was definitely reassuring to us, but in a way it's not so surprising because, you know, in a way, a lot of things determine the political appeal of a candidate in a state. Anti-dumping should indeed boost uh, votes, uh, you know, should help a politician to gain votes in a state, but doesn't pose the key thing. And one of the reasons why we use a retrospective conservative definition is that we are, you know, you could be concerned otherwise, although we don't find any evidence here, that if you use a forward-looking definition, definition of which states are swing at the end of a term could be affected by anti-dumping duties carried out during the term. This evidence suggests it's not the case, but even our baseline estimates are based on the past definition of swing states. So you're looking back, you're saying in the last presidential elections, which states were politically swing, you know, were below the 5% threshold indifference of vote shares. And then you're saying how that affects the uh, anti-dumping protection in the, during the next four years. So I think endogeneity, both, you know, this regression and in general, the fact that we use a retrospective definition of swing state, uh, reverse causality is, is not a concern. Could have been, I think, if we use forward definition and if this turned out to be, you know, this coefficient turned out to be significant, but I don't think it is, uh, yeah, I don't think it is in, in, in our data. And again, you know, you are, you should think that, you know, this variation, if you go, go back to the picture of which states are swing, you know, it's hard to believe that which one should become pink or, or red, whatever you see in the, whatever color you see in your screen, you know, is, is driven thought only by anti-dumping protection. Indeed, we find this is not the case. So there is some, uh, exogenous variation to anti-dumping that, that explains why, uh, why Florida is swing here and there, but not here. And that's what we are exploiting. And by the way, there is there are also a lot of uh, interesting case studies. There is a guy in Virginia who wrote a case study about these, uh, you know, this election post 2000, 2000 and Florida was swing. And, and uh, indeed there was, uh, Florida requests, so the, the shrimp and crawfish industry uh, petition for anti-dumping against China and other countries, Vietnam and others, they were producers of shrimp and crawfish. And, and this was successful. And in fact, there were uh, anti-dumping duties in the 200 or 300 that were introduced, very high duties. And a lot of other industries like the restaurant industry in particular, was trying to prevent these duties to come into play because these, uh, these were actually very costly for the restaurant industry, which, for which this uh, protected uh, you know, uh, seafood is an input, important input. But, the, but again, the restaurant industry was not concentrated in swing states, so they had no saying the, in, the measure were introduced. And this case study you know, by Peter De Bear, you know, points out that it was all driven by swing state politics and the fact that uh, the, the ITC and the DOC, you know, the key institution in charge of anti-dumping in the US were trying to please in the swing those states. But, uh, but basically I'm, I'm pretty confident that, you know, so the key assumption is indeed that these changes in the identity of swing states are exogenous to anti-dumping protection. And we show that indeed there's no, effect of anti-dumping protection on the identity of swing states. And in fact, the randomization we do also shows that if you basically create placebo swing states, you know, you cannot, uh, you know, predict anti-dumping protection. So, but anyway, I, this is not the question. So uh, I hope, you know, if whoever asked that question, if you are not satisfied with my answer, we can keep discussing and we can have, uh, you know, if not, if there are more questions, I'm here to very happy to, to take them. So I, I actually see the chat, the Q&A. So thank you for uh, my question is more policy level. How about raising efficiency in industry in the US rather than fighting China using protective tools? How could this be attained? Uh, well, I guess, you know, so what are, 
let me make a so I guess you know in general protection I, I agree you know is, I think you got that it doesn't help efficiency or doesn't help you know increases production costs and is not a good idea what I think maybe this you know study suggests if the goal you know it depends a little bit I'm replied to the anonymous attendee who asked this question on the Q and A if uh, um, if the question is jobs, if, if the goal of policymakers is to increase jobs, something that seems to increase jobs throughout is, is subsidies. So you, you give more subsidy to an industry and employment growth uh, increases in the industry. You give more subsidy to an industry and employment growth of those downstream of the subsidized industries increases and also of those industry upstream of the subsidized industry. So these regressions, and here we are not instrumenting, so we are not dealing with endogeneity of subsidies, but you know, these regressions, which for us are a robustness check, suggest that certain subsidies, if the goal is promoting growth, not efficiency. So you were asking about uh, efficiency, and, and this is not what we are trying to explain, but clearly, if you're looking at, uh, just simply the performance of an industry in terms of employment growth, subsidies are clearly fostering employment growth. However, notice that some of these subsidies could be WTO compatible and other ones are probably not. So they may lead to countervailing duties. So, but I guess, you know, uh, for efficiency, you may want, uh, you know, to subsidize uh, innovation or this would be the kind of policies that would, uh, potentially foster efficiency. Again, if, you, if uh, the person who asked the question want to step in, step in, sorry, uh, feel free. Yeah? And if you want to unmute yourself, I'm also, you know, happy to <laughs> see some faces. And I'm really cold here. I actually think I need to put on the, you know, the heating. Okay, thanks, Paula. I think- oh, no uh, So can you tell me actually now is, so I will, I want to, I'll be able to attend, is there a little break? Because I'll be able to attend some yes. of the morning sessions, not unfortunately in the afternoon, but uh, yeah, I'll be very happy to, to continue attending the mm. rest of the morning. Perfect, yeah. Thanks very much for your talk and also for the answers oh, yeah, to the no, questions. There are many more, uh, or a few more questions uh, on the chat. Uh, maybe you can have a look okay, at yeah, those we'll, we'll definitely later look at on. I think yeah. in the interest of time, we now, yeah. I will say should that, conclude here and okay. yes we continue at 10 45 okay uh, in okay. sessions um, all morning and all afternoon until uh, six o'clock this evening okay thanks very much paula thanks very much to all participants and um yeah we'll see you at, we now have a short break and we'll see you again at 10 45 for the parallel sessions thank you very much